Welcome to Next Round with the Pacific Research Institute. I'm your host, Rowena Itchon. This podcast is a recorded lecture from PRI's second annual policy conference in Sacramento. Our speaker, Judge Daniel Kulke, is a partner with Gibson, Dunn and Crutcher. He also served as an Associate Justice on the California Court of Appeals and Legal Affairs Secretary to Governor Pete Wilson. California is approaching warmer weather, and that means fire season. Judge Kulke believes that the governor can help mitigate future power outages and wildfires through his executive powers. In this lecture, Judge Kulke makes a case. Thanks for joining us. To begin our afternoon programs, we have a very interesting presentation uh, by the Honorable Dan Kolke. As you know, last year, millions of Californians suffered through devastating wildfires that ravaged across our state. Making matters worse were the widespread power outages by PG&E and other utilities in areas that faced a significant risk of another fire breaking out. PG&E was heavily criticized for turning off power to millions of homes for substantial periods of time. Many have called their actions unnecessary. Lawmakers and and the governor are considering legislation to prevent widespread lengthy power outages in times of future fire danger. And they are also considering a host of other policy changes to help reduce the risk of future deadly wildfires. But Dan Kolke argues that Governor Newsom already has significant powers to act to protect Californians. And he says the governor should put these powers to use in preparing for this year's fire season, which would negate the need for extended power outages. You have a copy of Dan's op-ed that was in the Orange County Register uh, last year. It's in your gift bag. And if you haven't read it, you must. So I'm pleased to invite the Honorable Dan Kolke back to the stage for his presentation. Thank you, Dan. Thank you very much, Sally. So as uh, Sally noted, I'm going to talk about how the governor can use his emergency powers to help reduce the power outages and the risk of fire. And let me provide a little context for all this before I get into some of the specifics. The fact of the matter is that uh, here in Northern California, PG&E faced with huge, massive liabilities from fires in 2015, 2017, and 2018, decided this past year, 2019, to start this deliberate policy of power outages to avoid transmission lines sparking fires during inclement weather. And in fact, Many of you may have uh, gone through some four days of outages because PG&E would turn the power off, and then after the weather condition passed, it wouldn't turn the power back on immediately because it was checking its transmission lines, which took another day. And by the end of that day of good weather, the weather had changed once again, and so the power outage started again, and there was no power for for days on end. Uh, And and by the way, uh, the risk of liability for these fires is always going to be hugely greater than any impact to PG&E from the power outages. I mean, just think of the campfire in uh, 2018 uh, that destroyed the town of Paradise. Uh, 85 people died from the campfire, and over 14,000 structures were destroyed by the campfire, which are more structures than were destroyed in the entire Great Chicago Fire of 1871. So the the liability is huge. And therefore, with a very dry February, experts are saying we're going to have a very dangerous fire season this year, and PG&E is liable to try and do the same constraint in terms of power to avoid the huge massive liabilities and loss of life that can result from the fires that are triggered by its transmission lines. Uh, As a result, as Sally noted, the California legislature and the governor have been proposing things, but listen to the proposals. Governor Newsom said he wants rebates to uh, basically reimburse people for the damage caused by the blackouts, Uh, and he wants to fine PG&E, and he's threatened a public takeover of PG&E. 
uh, Scott Weiner has uh, proposed a bill that would provide financial penalties for unduly long blackouts. Uh, Assemblyman Gray has uh, asked for an audit of the PUC to determine how it's managing uh, the utilities with respect to uh, uh, fire safety. Uh, but none of these things are really going to change the risk of power outages uh, this year. So let me now just start with <clears throat> the fact that it is going to be extremely expensive to try and uh, harden the energy infrastructure such that the risk of fire is reduced and thus the risk of blackouts is reduced. Uh, the PUC, to its credit, just recently announced a settlement with PG&E for $1.6 billion uh, as a result of the fires that had already occurred, uh, and investors will apparently fund this to provide some sort of fire prevention. But the costs are much more astronomical uh, PG&E just this month has asked for authorization to seek reimbursement for $900 million. Uh, and the $900 million is simply to pay for the cost of trimming trees from 2017 to 2019 and to provide some expanded inspections of transmission lines. So if it costs $900 million, almost a billion dollars, just to pay for the cost of trimming trees and enhanced inspection of transmission lines, you get an idea of how expensive it could really be to properly harden uh, the energy infrastructure to avoid these risks of fires uh, by ancient transmission lines easily getting downed, uh, equipment uh, breaking, and basically sparking these fires. So, uh, you know, where is this money going to come from? One problem of course, is that uh, California has provided these renewable energy requirements, uh, which are very costly. In fact, is this year, 2020, state law requires the utilities to generate 33% of their electrical energy through renewables. 33%. In four years, that 33% has got to be increased not to 36%, not to 40%. In four years, state law mandates it to go up to 44% renewable energy. In three more years after that, 2027, it's got to go to 50% renewable energy. And by 2030, in 10 years, it's supposed to go to 60% renewable energy. And by the way, I pulled the floor reports for the last bill that pushed the requirements up to 60% in 10 years, Senate Bill 350, and there was nothing in the floor report that analyzed the cost of doing that or analyzed whether this would have a significant impact on climate change. Uh, and in fact, California is responsible for less than 1% of greenhouse gases in the world. So the question is, uh, should you know, some of this renewable energy obligations be temporarily reduced to help shift funds uh, to provide for the uh, refurbishment of the energy infrastructure that California needs? And by the way, the PG&E energy infrastructure, they developed most of their electrical transmission lines and so on in the early 20th century. PG&E has 40 hydroelectric plants. They were all built before 1950, and the electrical lines that accompany those hydroelectric plants were built around the same time. So we are talking about very aged equipment here. And yet, because of the expense in getting renewable energy, and by the way, Swiss credit reports that PG&E has committed itself uh, to five times the going rate for renewable energy because it's felt it had to get these commitments because by state law it's mandated to have this renewable energy of increasing levels. So they are paying five times the going rate now for an amount in $2 billion. As a result, 
Californians pay 50% more for their energy costs than the average U.S. citizen. And because of the high energy costs, PG&E then has to pay another half billion dollars to provide subsidies to low-income groups. So you've got billions going to the renewable energy, half a billion going to subsidize low-income people, of course, who need it, but they need it because of the elevated energy costs. And then PG&E also has to pay another $125 million uh, with respect to uh, no-cost weatherization and efficiency for disadvantaged communities. So we are, you know, it's so clearly totaling more and more money. And then beyond that, to get buy-in by the California public to these renewable energy goals, uh, the climate change uh, legislation arranges for cap-and-trade funds from climate change to provide a climate credit to every ratepayer. I think I got about $20 this year from that. But if you go back to 2012 and you look at all of the payments going from cap and trade to ratepayers for buy-in for various ratepayer subsidies and so on, uh, it turns out that we have spent $7.5 billion since 2012 in these ratepayer benefits. So given all that, you know, why not provide some balance here as to the cost of renewable energy for the future hope that this will have an impact on climate change and instead shift the money to protecting the public today, now, to provide a reduction in the risk of fire and power outages by moving the resources into refurbishing our energy uh, infrastructure. The governor has the power to actually do a lot of this alone because under the California Emergency Services Act, the governor has the right in a state of emergency to lift, suspend any regulatory statute and to suspend any order or regulation from any agency if it is done to meet the emergency. So how does the act define an emergency? The act says that the governor is authorized to mitigate the effects of an emergency defined as any natural or man-made cause of emergency which results in conditions of disaster or in extreme peril to life, property, and the resources of the state that are likely beyond the control of any single county or city. Well, certainly the risk of fire and death or power outages that results in respiration machines shutting down, uh, food uh, spoiling, uh, businesses uh, being damaged, cell reception being undermined so you can't call uh, in an emergency, that certainly seems to me to qualify as a condition of disaster or extreme peril to life property, uh, and it's likely beyond the control of any single county or city, uh, and in fact is for much less than the peril that these fires cause, there have been states of emergency that have been upheld by the courts. Governor Schwarzenegger had a state of emergency uh, with respect to prison overcrowding. And that was upheld as a proper state of emergency by which the governor could lift regulatory statutes and regulations uh, by the California Court of Appeal. Uh, and in fact, a, a governor's emergency powers have been used extremely effectively in the past. In 1994, during the Northridge earthquake, uh, when the earthquake buckled Santa Monica Freeway, which was really the artery between West LA and downtown LA, uh, Governor Wilson declared a state of emergency. And then, because he had the power to lift regulatory statutes and regulations, he was able to lift all the lengthy bidding process requirements and immediately contract with a company uh, to fix the Santa Monica Freeway. And then he was free to provide them bonuses for every day that they finished the work early. The contract provided for fixing the Santa Monica Freeway in 140 days. And with the bonuses and the quick action of the governor, the Santa Monica Freeway got rebuilt not in the 140 days of the contract, 
or 120 days, or 100 days, but in 66 days, basically two months through the governor's unilateral action in exercising those emergency powers. So here, the governor could lift, just temporarily, the obligations for meeting these higher renewable energy requirements. Uh, the governor uh, could actually call on the mutual aid of subdivisions of the state because part of that Emergency Services Act allows the governor to call in uh, help from local government. You could train people to trim trees, uh, to start trimming back foliage. You could lift environmental regulations that restrict the trimming of trees in certain segments to get this done quickly. Uh, you could move these resources uh, from cap and trade to uh, the utility companies to strengthen their infrastructure for their energy transmissions. Uh, by just lifting some of these requirements, you would free up resources as well to do this, and you could get the job done. And there's no better time to do it now because PG&E is in bankruptcy, so you've also got the power of the bankruptcy court to provide all kinds of solutions, including subsequent reimbursement arrangements. So, I mean, given that you've got the governor's power, the PUC that has oversight, and a bankruptcy court, uh, the ability to fix this problem in a more uh, efficient manner and a more timely manner is absolutely at its pinnacle right now. So uh, I, I basically conclude by saying, you know, why not, rather than spending the resources that may or may not have an effect on climate change in the hopes of affecting it 40 years in the future, why not expend some of these resources for the consequence of climate change now in protecting the public against fires and against unduly long power outages, which can also affect the lives and health uh, and happiness of the public. So thank you. Why not? Why is he not doing anything, Dan? Well, what, what, what is the stumbling block? <laughs> well, uh, my speculation is that he does not want to be in the position of seeming to backtrack on the renewable energy goals. And, you know, the, I mean, the fact of the matter is I've been told by many how powerful the environmental movement is in the state. And even if it's reasonable and temporary, uh, no one wants to be criticized uh, for backing away from the fight against climate change. It's, you know, become almost a religion in the sense that most people who are fighting for these you know, climate change objectives don't necessarily understand the science as to how any particular reduction is going to really affect climate change, and it's really just based on faith. And when something is based on faith as opposed to science, uh, it's very hard for someone to show flexibility. I mean, how do you show flexibility when it's a matter of faith as opposed to, you know, empiricism? Question, you know, executive power sometimes cuts both ways. Are there any things that we might have to fear a little bit of encouraging this governor, certainly, <laughs> to use his uh, executive powers more than he already is? Well, I'd say, you know, a couple things. One is there's always a risk, you know, with any existing power that it gets abused. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you know, where you, you, you at least are limited to the fact that it's got to be an emergency. So it's got to be something of, you know, disaster or extreme peril. And, of course, we've seen, particularly in this state, that people are not slow to sue government if in fact they think that something's being done against their interests. So ultimately, the courts can provide a constraint against expanding the emergency powers beyond what's a true emergency. Uh, I think that Governor Schwarzenegger's 
exercise of that right uh, with respect to prison overcrowding probably reaches the upper limits of a situation that could be called an emergency, and it was called an emergency because of the risk of having to release prisoners uh, you know, into the public because the prisons couldn't hold them anymore. That probably you know, was at uh, the limit of it. But I think when you get down to you know, fire safety and the damage of power outages, I think you're well within what the emergency powers are supposed to cover. And therefore, I would argue that the constraint against the abuse of power would be through the courts. Uh, I think what would be very interesting and I'll just throw this out here, is that, uh, you know, could you say that California's in a state of emergency with respect to the lack of affordable housing? I'd say that is really, you know, one that you're kind of pushing the envelope quite a bit, but I could certainly see the case being made, and frankly, if you did that, just think of how you could actually create a huge amount of affordable housing. If you could lift the regulations and the regulatory statutes that make it so expensive to build housing in this state. I mean, I read somewhere in the statistic may or may not be right, but I read somewhere that just, you know, one unit of housing can be at a cost of like $750,000. Well, if the cost of building a unit of affordable housing is $750,000, how can you ever make anything affordable? I mean, that's just, it's not, you know, it's, it's the economics of making affordable housing is not economic at all. So, but all these costs are being imposed by, I, I call it, you know, death by a thousand cuts, because there's so many things that are now required, whether it's, you know, solar panels or what your energy hookup has to be, or the materials that you have to use. There's so many things, and each one seems a great idea alone. But when you combine them all, you create a situation where it just becomes too expensive to create affordable housing uh, in the state. So... I, I think, you know, the emergency powers, you know, can be something, you know, done for good. I mean, the one, well, there's, by the way, the, Tim, there's one other, you know, idea as to the constraint against the abuse of that power, and that is, is when the governor exercises his or her emerg emergency powers, you know exactly who's responsible for the action. It's not diffused so that you can't really determine who's really responsible for it. There is someone responsible, and so the the obligation to take responsibility of your, for your action, I think, can be a constraint as well. Do the um, environmentalists ever talk about the sources of their uh, mining, manufacturing, uh, producing the metals and materials, um, transporting that, manufacturing that, where it comes from, all that whole side of the environmental movement? It seems to be they magically appear as windmills or solar panels. Right. Well... You know, I have, not, I have not studied the infrastructure for creating the renewable energy, but there are certainly reports that note that the infrastructure in creating some of the renewable energy can actually create more greenhouse gases than, say, natural gas uh, that's being used. And by the way, I mean, one, you know, very good thing about the environmental movement uh, is that it does kind of push, for instance, the gas companies and the oil companies to find better ways to produce the fossil fuel energy in ways that mitigate the greenhouse gases. So, I mean, the, the problem is, is that we're not using common sense in finding ways to mitigate the greenhouse gases from fossil fuels like natural gas and, of course, the companies are doing a lot against flaring and so on. And we're spending, you know, putting all of our... Uh, apples in the basket on unaffordable renewable energy sources. So it would be, you know, a lot better if the legislature, when it's mandating these requirements, would have some backup as to what the cost is and what the impact's going to be as to what they're doing. Clearly, you need a mix. And at some point, you know, society will move more to uh, sort of carbon neutral energy sources. It's just a question of, you know, how quickly you do it and whether or not you're creating peril now at the very time that you're trying to move towards these renewable sources for a hope of what it's going to do in the future. 
Special thanks to Judge Dan Kolke. If you like this episode, please tell your friends and subscribe to PRI's podcast at iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, or TuneIn. And please do us a favor and give us five stars. You can also listen to our podcast on PRI's YouTube page, youtube.com slash pacificresearch1. That's the number one. Thanks for listening. I'm Rowena Itchon. Hope you'll come back again for next round with PRI.